So welcome to our overview of hiring H-1B employees at Penn. Uh, my name is Daniel Deck. I'm an advisor at um, ISSS. Um, I'm here with Chiwe, who will let, um, introduce herself. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. So nice to see all of you today. I know that some of you, well, some of you are, are new, but some of you are our old friend. So yeah, and Natalia, I see you. Wow, thank you. This is so nice. The in office, it's so nice to see the bright, like blue sky and then yeah, to feel the air. Okay. So uh, thank you everyone. My name is Chi Wei Huan Ma and I'm the assistant director for faculty and scholar support at ISSS. And today I have my colleague Daniel here. He is one of our um, best um, best advisors processing H1Bs. So today we are going to go through the overview, overview of hiring H1B employees at Penn. And then we are going to go through all the PowerPoint slides and then just feel free to ask questions in the meantime, because we do not have too many people today. Um, or if you want to type your question while we are doing the presentation. Yeah, then do you want to add anything? No, that's it. Yeah, like Chiwe said, you know, feel free throughout to kind of, you know, unmute yourself or use the chat um, to kind of ask questions. Like Chiwe said, you know, it's a small group, so we're going to try to make this a little more interactive, right? Cool, yeah, very good. All right, um, let's get started. Um, all right, so H-1B, so we're gonna look at the basic concepts of the H-1B um, to start with here, all right? Next slide, Mike, please. So what's an H-1B temporary worker? So it's an alien who is coming temporarily to the United States to perform services in a specialty occupation, which is a bit difficult to define, but basically um, a lot of the positions here in, in Penn fall under, like most of them like research associates, um, professors, um, and a lot of different other things. It's hard to get into all the specifics, but that's the basic gist of it. Um, go ahead, Mike, next one, please. Um, so for example, some of the requirements of this are that they require at least a bachelor's degree in a specific academic field, um, a license or certification required for employment, um, such as like a medical license um, or something of that nature. And then of course, the candidate must meet the minimum position requirements at the time of filing. Um, yes, so it's very much what is in the posting um, the candidate must have. Okay, uh, next one, please, Mike. Of course, um, along with a lot of our H-1B um, holders and applicants, beneficiaries, they, a lot of them have families and they fall under H-4 um, status. Um, for that, they can apply for employment authorization only if the H-1B uh, principal holder is in the advanced stage of the green card process. Um, so you, typically this is where the um, I-485 has been filed and pending. So that's very, very deep into the green card process. And otherwise, H-4 applicants or holders usually are not authorized for employment. Um, <clears throat> the H-4 application is a personal application. Um, so when you have um, an H-4 um, beneficiary a holder, um, we are happy to file that application along with the petition as a courtesy. Um, we don't really review it for them. Um, it's really on the app, um, applicant and the beneficiary to really um, do that on their own. Um, if they don't file it with the application, they can fi file it later, but we need the petition, the H-1B petition to be receded so that they can be tied together. Um, both the petition and ap application can be tied together. Okay. Uh, Mike, thanks. So back to H-1B. So the basics are that the H-1B is specific to a job, the employer and the location. Um, and that's why a lot of, we focus on a lot of the job description that um, is handed to us. So the job work sites, um, the academic department, the job duties and stuff like that. Those are really, really important to the H-1B processing. Um, H itself, you're 
allowed a maximum of six years, unless, of course, um, there are other situations like an I-140 involved, green card processing and stuff like that. And we can only request three years at a time maximum. Um, you, any shorter time is also allowed, but three is the max. H-1B is special because it has dual intent, which is both non-immigrant and immigrant. So a lot of our students who start on F, which is non-immigrant specific, they can't really go into green card processing, but the H-1B allows for that. It kind of bridges that for a lot of applicants from the non-immigrant into immigrant as H-1B allows for both. Um, the petition itself for H-1B is filed through ISSS. And of course, we send it off to USCIS for its final adjudication. So what are the different types of H-1B? So to gain H-1B status, if, you, if the uh, beneficiary doesn't hold it, is consular or change of status. So consular, of course, is when the um, beneficiary is either already outside of the U.S. or will need to travel outside of the U.S. to go to a U.S. consulate and obtain the visa stamp um, and then enter into the United States in H-1B status. The other is change of status, so that's where the beneficiary is currently in the United States on a separate status, such as F or J, and then we change it while that um, person is in the United States, and it becomes effective the, the start date of that status, and the, the person does not need to depart the U.S. Next one, please. Um, so those are the two initial types, um, the consular and the change of status. Uh, the other kinds of petitions that we file are extensions, so of course it if those um, three years are expiring and the um, department wants to add another three years or another you know duration to that, that's an extension. Um, it's important to be aware that when the extension is filed, the employment is continued, continued from the expiration date for 240 days while that application is pending. So if, you know, that may be important if we're budgeting with premium processing and stuff like that to know that it doesn't need to be processed right away. Um, also amendments, which is um, any material change to the previously approved uh, H-1B position. So for example, the addition of a new work site um, or a change in position title, um, those would be um, amendments for the H-1B and they need to be filed and receded prior to the change. Mm. So if you wanna add a new work site to the person, there's a new lab, for example, you need to let us know we need to have it sent in and receipted before the worker can go to that new work site. Yeah, so so this one I I actually want to add a note. Like for amendment, if you are foreseeing a person that will be promoted to a different position and this new position has a lot of uh, job duty added or or uh or has a supervisory duty added, then please do let us know before this even happen. So we will need to, for example, if this person from a position as a staff, but then now that you guys want to give this person with more duties with some uh, with a supervisory duty, or there are some added uh, job duties that are not originally in his uh, current uh, job duties or her job duties, that we please just contact us and let us make a decision whether an amendment is needed. If an amendment is needed, this person cannot be promoted to another position until we file the amendment. So please just be very, very careful with this. Yeah, I agree. Um, like, I mean, I just, I think last week I did receive an email with some changes to a position um, and I reviewed it and it did not require an amendment, but it was really nice to receive that email to be like, hey, we're thinking about changing these things. Yeah. Um, can you please review in advance? And that was really appreciated. Um, yeah. So um, the other types are the portability, which is a change of employer. So if you have a, um, someone working at a different company who is coming into Penn but already holds H-1B status, uh, we just file another, it's called port, um, move, basically moving the H-1B from the previous employer under Penn. <clears throat> that obviously just needs to be receded um, before the worker can move to Penn. And then, of course, the last one here listed is the concurrent H-1B employment, um, where the beneficiary basically holds two H-1Bs 
uh, one at company A and then the other one at Penn um, so that the person can work at both companies at the same time. Okay. So what are the departmental duties um, for hiring? So conducting hiring procedures, such as ensuring the specific de degree that is required for the position and that the candidate has that degree. The experience is definitely list listed there, but I think um, stress is definitely on the degree itself um, as a, that's more important um, for a lot of the H-1B um, proceedings. And the, that's one thing I think personally, um, I find sometimes with some of the stuff that comes across my desk is, the um, the major field of study um, is a really important factor in all of that for the what's required for the position and what the um, beneficiary holds. Um, also, setting a reasonable start date, considering um, internal and external <clears throat> external processing times. Um, I know sometimes we want to get things moving quickly, but these do take a lot of time to review and make sure that everything's right because we don't want to deal with um, denials or our fees and stuff like that. So it can take us a while to go through the documents to make sure everything's um, properly set up for a submission to USCIS. And then, of course, USCIS with processing times. Uh, obviously, if you do premium, it's a they guarantee an answer within 15 business days. And then with regular processing, um, I think it's currently at three or four months right now, but that's still no guarantee. Um, oh, can you go back real quick, Mike? Sorry. And then in that, knowing that, um, submitting a complete H-1B request to ISSS, ideally six months in advance. So we cannot request an H-1B, any kind of um, petition for H-1B more than six months before the requested start date. Um, so, um, if you're requesting something for like October next year, you're going to have to wait until, you know, the spring to do that for April to come around. Um, and then of course, give us at least 90 days to process that. So three months. Um, and then of course, applications with the, with the start date, less than 60 days, um, of submission are subject to an additional rest fee. Um, I will add with the idea of six months is if you know right now that you're going to have an H coming in within the next six months, I would get it in now. Um, we may be subject to some changes upcoming. So if you're able to get those in, I would try to get those in as soon as possible. All right. Next one, Mike, please. Um, and of course, this is just how you do it. You go in. In IPEN, um, you select the H-1B, and then you add all the information um, that you have regarding the employee, the position, uh, work sites, and stuff like that. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, which is going to be the position description. Um, the position description, um, as kind of detailed as you can with the work duties and responsibilities, really helps us in determining um, the wage and stuff like that, that will be required to submit to the Department of Labor, um, along with the actual wage worksheet and declaration, we'll need that. Uh, Departmental request and summary, understanding of H-1B employment, and then the expert control attestation form for certain departments is required as well. And you can see the departments here, for example, C's, biochem, stuff like that. Um, if it's an initial H-1B for a postdoc position, we'll also require the J-1 postdoc policy waiver exception approval notice, um, and that will be required as well for us to process the H-1B request. If it's a staff position, um, the job posting from Workday, um, please follow these instructions. You're just going to navigate to the relevant job posting, uh, click the printer icon, and choose overview, details, uh, requisition, compensation, uh, organizations and qualifications and save it all so that you can package that up and send it our way so we can review it as well. And all that's really in, um, important for us to review and look at so we can make sure that the position is properly vetted as well as the beneficiary. Uh, next, please, Mike. And then, of course, you just take all those documents um, in IPEN as part of the um, e-form that you complete and you just upload it here. Um, so that we can, you know, take a look on, at it on our end. 
Go ahead, Mike. Once all that's submitted um, and packaged up, it goes to an advisor, at which point um, we will receive it, review it, uh, confirm that it has been received, um, who the advisor is, and then, of course, that advisor will be the primary contact for any questions you have regarding the case and where it is um, or anything else that comes up along the way. Go ahead, Mike. Um, for the check process, um, checks are printed on a weekly basis and Penn Global staff pick it up. Um, they are matched to the applications and submitted with the rest of the visa petition materials. All the payments must be submitted as non-PO payment requests through the Penn Marketplace um, and the suppliers, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, important to note that on the questions tab, enter H-1B employees first and last name and then the item description of payment. Um, the reason for that is we would like to, the name will show up and sometimes it gets cut off. So we need to be able to match. Um, personally, I always ask for the check numbers. Um, but that's just me. Um, our advisors, we all have our own system, but doing uh, following those instructions with the employee's first and last name can help avoid any confusion um, on our end. Okay. Uh, Chi Wei, I think you're up. Okay. So uh, basically, if your department would like to hire, uh, foreign like nationals to be on H-1B, it's really rely on each one of you to submit an e-form um, through our IPEN system. And then Penn just, uh, then just uh, complete the first part of the e-form submission and everything. So now I'm going to go through what do you, what do you uh, recommend it to do? And then what are the things that we recommend not to do? Okay, so the first thing that we would confirm that please just uh, remember that H-1B, you want to this minimum requirement, minimum required qualification for the position, not for the person. Okay, so when you submit everything, even though that you are trying to submit a petition or an e-form to sponsor a person, but then when you do position description, Remember that you have to submit this position description. This position description is geared toward to the position, not for this person. So you guys have to do this the minimum required qualification for this position. And then when you do this major field of study, recommend it to add, like, for example, if you want to hire a, a, a research associate, then you can say uh, biology or related field, okay, or perform. And then when you say duties, like this person's major duties, you can say perform other duties as assigned at the end. Okay, and then just want to be consistent with the official job, job description. Um, on the HR file, mainly the workday, you want to make sure that the workday description is consistent with what you are going to uh, put in the position description. And also remember to provide all work locations for this employee. For example, if this employee will be work from home and this person's uh, like home, home residence is in Maryland, then you just want to make sure to put his or her Maryland location in the e-form as well. So when we say provide all work location, doesn't necessarily mean that physical, lo well, doesn't necessarily mean that only the pen location. It could include every location that this person will be, will be, uh, will be working from while he or she start this position. On the right is the do not, okay? Do not this prefer or at your minimum requirement. We want to make sure that this is a minimum required qualification, not the preferred qualification, okay? And then also do not tailor to preferred H-1B employees qualification. Just like what I have mentioned, when you complete the H-1B position description, this is about the position, not about the person, okay? And then Sometimes we will see people this uh, one or two under supervisory responsibility. 
if people may say, well, this person uh, supervise one or two student workers, or this person supervise one of the postdoc or something. So we just want to clarify here that for supervisor or supervisory responsibility basically means that this person has to supervise a staff member. Okay, and not only supervise to staff member that this person has to decide a promotion, decide a hiring, and has to uh, has to write an annual evaluation for this person. With this uh, qualification, then you may say, well, this person supervise. They, this person does have some uh, supervisory duty. If this person only supervise student workers or poster, that doesn't mean supervise. Or if this person is working on a team and did a group of staff member on a project, but not decide the salary or promotion or even termination or writing any uh, evaluation for these staff members, then this is not supervised. This is not supervisory responsibility. Okay, next. Okay, so for employee duties that, well, you know that there are five parts of, um, of the e-form, right? So first part is about the position, second part, that once you complete the first part, then the e-form will be directed out to the, uh, to the employee directly. Okay, so the employee, they have to complete everything in the e-form to be able to uh, move forward in the process. So basically, we will ask them to come from e form two, and then we will ask them to submit all the required document, and then, uh, yeah, and then, and then kind of explain to them what is H one B status, and they have to maintain their H one B status. All right, next slide, Mike. Okay, number three is about this one. It's especially important for those employees that will be hired by the School of Medicine or Engineering or School of Engineering and Applied Sciences or Nursing School or Dental School or Vet School. Okay, and also the following department within SAS. Okay, so within SAS, they are not, they, they are only certain uh, departments needed to complete this as export control biology chemistry physics earth and environmental science and astronomy so basically this is just trying to ask the department to disclose how much confidential information that this person or this position will be uh, will get access to so we want to make sure that there is no uh concern and we want to make sure that uh, that the department release the information to uh, for 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 the for the USCIS as to this position hire a specific person to do. Okay, next one. Okay, so next one is a very uh very important and significant part of the H one B processing. This is basically uh basically um the first step of the H-1B processing when we need to reach out to a government agency. So when we process H-1B, the first step, once we, once each advisor that we reach, uh, we receive an H-1B document, that we will review the document. And once we evaluate everything and get majority of the document, that we will start the next step. And then this is a very important step. This means that we have to report the, the, the labor condition application. We will need to get it certified from the Department of Labor. So doing a wage analysis, as I, I would say is the most important part to decide whether your department will be able to hire a person. So we will need to make sure the real wage, the wage that your department is proposed to pay this person is higher than the prevailing wage in Philadelphia metropolitan area. So what does it mean for prevailing wage? So prevailing wage is basically the wage paid to similarly situated employees in a specific occupation in the area of intended employment. What I mean is that if you plan to hire 
a research associate, and this research associate is、uh, mainly doing some、um, biological experiments or analyses. Then、uh, you want to make sure that your department pay this person higher or at least reach the reach the wage with、uh, other people simi with some simi similarly. Situated employees in similar occupation in the area of Philadelphia Metropolitan. So usually, this analysis will be done by us. So we have a very clear database provided by the Department of Labor, and we will look into the job duties, and then we will compare the job and try to pick a pick a specific、uh, job in the data of the of the Department of、um, Labor. So we want to make sure that your department reach the minimum wage requirement, the prevailing wage requirement in the Department of La、uh, Department of Labor database. So most of the time, our pay department will pay higher than the prevailing wage. But sometimes you may receive email from our advisor saying that, well, if you want to have this person do this job, and this job require, for example, five years of experience, and you and with this job duties, and this person also have a supervisory duties, then you may need to pay more according to the database in the Department of Labor. So.、Um, So if you cannot reach the level the Department of Labor require for the prevailing wage, then we we may not be able to move forward in the process. So this is about the prevailing wage. So prevailing wage basically compare this position with those people in Philadelphia, a、uh, metropolitan area, in very similar um uh similar job du with very similar job duties, and actual wage. Is about this employee need to be pay cannot be paid less than those people in the same department with similar title, similar duty, similar qualification. So you just want to make sure that for this new employee, the department cannot pay them less than those people who are already working on this job and with similar duties. So we will have a list like in our e form. Then you guys have to complete and let us know that well, there are five people on the team doing the same job, same duties, and they are paying the very similar or at least some.、Um, they cannot be paid higher than the person that you are going to hire if if they have the same duties and similar qualification. Okay, so if you find someone who is paying more than this position, then you want to give us some reason. Okay, some justification. So this is about a required wage analysis.、Um, Mike. Okay. So this is about actual wage sheets. So if you try to complete your e form, just about just like what I say that if、um, this position, the person who is going to be hiring into this position, the position. Cannot be cannot be paid less than the person who are working on the same project or with the same job duties in the same department, right? But how if just someone just was paid higher than this position, then you want to uh let us know why, okay? So there is a a form a chart that、uh, you will you will see when you submit your H one B E form. So in this H one B E form, that if you if um if there are someone that are pay more than the position, okay, then you want to let us know why. So you want to let us know the experience, the qualification, or this person's background, and then、uh, why this person is paying more. And most of the time, the department will tell us that well, this person even though with similar qualifications, similar job duties, but this person has more years of experience. This person has five more years of experience, or two more years of experience, and then guess what? I think that's a very legitimate、um, uh, reason for for a person pay, paying higher than this、uh, new employee. So you just want to give us justification. 
and this one we always have to keep in our record because going forward maybe the USCIS has someone coming to audit the file they will need to see this okay all right next um next slide thank you Mike Okay, so this is a labor condition application. It's just like what I have mentioned that when we try to do prevailing wage analysis, once we make sure the prevailing wage analysis, or uh, once we make sure that this person is paying more than the prevailing wage analysis, uh, prevailing wage um, decided by the Department of Labor, then we will file a labor condition application through the Department of Labor's website. Okay, and then now, uh, most of the time, we will get this labor condition application certified within seven days. Okay, it will be done in seven days if there is nothing wrong, if the Department of Labor agree with our analysis. So this is the first step that we have to reach out to the Department of Labor and make sure that they, they are, they certify our uh, application, and then we can move forward to the final step to submit everything together to the USCIS. Okay, so just like what I have mentioned, the first step. Well, once you submit your uh, I your H one B document, then the first step is that you will receive our advisor give you an email and give you a general initial case analysis, right? And once we receive the document and receive the, receive the clarification from your department, then we will file the first step. We will file the labor condition application to the Department of Labor, okay? And once this Department of Labor, um, they certify, our labor condition application. Once we receive the certification, we will then put together all the document that you guys provided us, and we will write up a petition for this specific H-1B employee included this labor condition application. So we finalize everything and we mail it to the United uh, to the USCIS. So I think Dan just mentioned that there are two type of um, processing that, that the department could choose. One is regular. Regular processing now is taking about two to nine months. If some departments are lucky, we do have employees that got, got the approval within three months, okay, with regular. But then I would say that if, there, if budget is not a huge issue for your department, I would always, always recommend premium, okay? Because with premium, not only that the USCIS will let us know their decision within 15 business day, I think one of the best, uh, best part of the premium for me personally is that once I submit this petition, they will email me and let me know that they have already received my petition. Okay, we have examples or experience in the past that we submit a regular processing H-1B to, uh, to the USCIS, but we never receive the, res uh, we never receive the tracking. Okay, so they really put us, yeah, well, we, we cannot even track our, uh, our case until perhaps after one or two months we receive the paper receipt. So if you guys are going to sponsor new employment, I would really highly recommend that just do premium because you do not want to risk like maybe the package got lost, right? And we did not know about it until one or two months we hear nothing from the USCIS and we get back to them and we find out, well, it got lost or there's something wrong with the package then the department, uh, then the USCIS did not even notify us earlier. So try to up for premium processing if budget is not a huge, it's, it's not a very big issue for your department. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So um, for once we submit the petition to the USCIS, for regular, just like what I said, it will take about two to seven months, right? But for premium, it will take about 15 
business day. So during the processing, during when the USCIS review the document, if they feel like, well, there are something they want to get further clarification, for example, if uh, they do not believe this job is a specialty occupation, okay, then just mention the, the qualification for specialty occupation. So if the USC, USCIS has different opinion from us, or the USCIS do not believe this is a specialty occupation, they may just um, write or issue a request for further evidence, saying that, well, we do not agree with you. Please provide more evidence to support the, the, the specialty occupation. Okay, or they may have found um, them. So this is just like when they need more information to support your petition. So if we receive a request for further evidence, then we will notify the department right away. And then we will let you know why and what's the issue. Okay, and then we will just need to work together and provide evidence to, um, to, uh, to submit again to the USCIS and hoping to get an approval, okay? So this is uh, one thing. But then if the USCIS does not find anything wrong, they support our petition, they will just give us some um, approval, okay? So once we receive approval, most of the time, if it is a premium processing, that's another benefit for premium processing is that we will receive an email approval before everything. Okay, so within 15 minutes that if this case is being approved, that we will receive an email approval so that uh, we will know that, oh, this case is being approved, so we don't need to worry about anything. We just need to wait for the printed copy of approval to arrive, okay? So, uh, most, so when we receive the approval, either email approval or printed approval, we will notify the department, and then we will provide the e-copy of the approval um, to the department and the employee. This is only when this case is, is requested with premium processing. With regular processing, we will never receive an email from the USCIS. They will communicate with you with printed copy. That's why they will, if the printed copy of the approval or a request or the receipt got lost, we, it's, it's really hard, very, very hard for us to track. Okay, so once we notify your department that the printed copy of the approval has arrived, that we will send you an official notice, and then either the department of the H1B employee can come and arrange a meet, like just arrange a pickup appointment to come pick up the original copy of the approval, and want to make sure that um, the department could just uh, maintain a copy, a photocopy of the document, and then you guys can just give the original copy of the approval to the employees. Okay, next, next slide. When can a Trump employee begin? Okay, this is a very, uh, like, this is a very common question. We receive a lot of uh, this question. When can they start? Okay, if this person is a new employment, if this is a new employment petition, that means that when I say new employment, doesn't necessarily mean that this person is currently working, let's say Thomas Jefferson on H1B and come in to UPenn to work as a new employee. If this person is currently on H1B already, then this is not a new employment. This is a change of employer petition. Okay, so when we say change of status or new employment, that means that this person is currently in a different visa status. For example, this person is currently on OPT, F1 OPT. He just graduated from uh, Jackson University and coming to Penn to work. So this is a new employment because that he is currently on F1 and he will be changed his status to H1B. With this kind of uh, petition or request, I would say please just um, request a premium processing because you cannot afford <laughs> for the document to get lost and nobody know where the, like, where the document is, right? So try to request premium processing if it's a new employment. And another thing is that this person cannot, cannot start working until we have the printed copy of the approval. Okay, so it will take 
longer period of time, we submit and we receive the email approval within 15 business days. And it will take the USCIS about one or two weeks for them to ship us and let us receive the approval. So if you have a new employment, be sure to submit the case as soon as possible. And be sure, I would say 99% if, if possible, try, please try to use premium processing. We do not like to, we do not like to see a gap in the employment. We will try our best to help you, but then premium processing is, is highly recommended, especially for new employment. But if this person is currently abroad, then uh, they can only start once they are physically in the United States in H1B. Okay, and the start date has already started or the start date is current. Okay. So if they are in H1B status so already, for example, they are changing uh, from the other uh, employer or they have a change or they have an extension or an amendment for extension and amendment because they are already working at Penn, they can actually start right after we submit the case. But for change of employer, then we they can they can start when we receive the receipt. Okay. This okay. Oh, next slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if a person is outside of the United States and then your department would like to hire him or her to an H-1B position, and like and this person currently does not have an H-1B, then a new H-1B visa will be required. Okay, because they want to come into the United States on H-1B, so they need to go for an H-1B visa appointment. And here, if you can, so depends on the country, H-1B visa like appointment could be easy to make or could or in other countries it may take a long time so it's really uh, depends on the country okay so you can uh, go on this like on um, uh, state department of state website and they have a list of country and the wait time okay so it's just like what we have on our powerpoint slide okay next slide please Okay. So after the pandemic, we actually haven't really um, encountered any of the audit from the USCIS. But before the pandemic, we do have some site visit. What does it mean for FDNS site visit? It means that the Office of the Fraud Detection and National Security Office within the USCIS, they either come personally to UPenn to to uh to just order one of the, one or several of the H1B employees, they want to make sure there is no issue, or they may call you, or they may call the employee directly. So when you have employees reach out to you saying that they receive a phone call from USCIS, they want to clarify their status, please just feel free to call us. Okay, so we will handle everything for you. We do not want an employee just answer, just give. The, the unwanted answer or give incorrect answer like due to their uh, their their lack of uh, immigration knowledge so just want to make sure that uh, make sure that if there is a visit just let us know okay and administrative visit or very yeah this is an administrative visit for verification okay of fact so they just want to make sure that what we submitted to the United, to the USCIS all the facts or all the information or the document are correct. Okay. Oh, and then we have, um, yeah, if you receive the visit, just, yeah, you can call our office or you can, well, send an email, I think it's too slow, just call our office right away. Yeah. Right, next slide. Okay, this is very important that this is an ongoing departmental responsibility. So um, once we help you get the H-1B approval and an H-1B employee start to work in your department, that your department has this ongoing responsibility. So um, 
I think we mentioned when Dan was giving presentation that if there are any changes to the approved employment, please, please do let us know before you move a person to a different position. Sometimes it may be fine because there's not considered a significant change, but sometimes it's not fine. So we understand that it's really hard for the department to make the, uh, to, to, to make the judgments. So please just let us know if there is any change. I remember that then have a department reach out to him that, well, this person will have a merit increase for that $3,000. And then, yeah, then we'll just look into all the, all the detail and then decide, well, this is not an amendment. There is no amendment needed. But we really appreciate just that then men mentioned that we really appreciate uh, that if you guys can let us know earlier and just get a yes or we need to know more information from from this change and then we can make a determination. So just want to be very, very careful because we do not want to make our employee violate their status. If they are moving to a much higher position and they are receiving much higher salary and and started to supervise people then we really need to report this to the to the USCIS or if this person's salary has been decreased for two thousand dollars or something we need to report to the to the USCIS or another thing is just like they mentioned that if this person well this one is come well I would not say common but more and more, we see more and more issue about this we have a department this person used to work on Penn campus, but now that the department allowed this person to work, work from home, and his home is not, it's not in Philadelphia. His home is in New Jersey, okay, Princeton, okay, or New York City. Then you guys have to let us know before, before this person is allowed to do so, because we have to report to the US, uh, USCIS. And then, for example, we have to, for example, the, the salary required by Princeton, um, Princeton, uh, New Jersey will be maybe higher than Philadelphia. So your department need to really make sure that you are willing to pay that much money to allow this person to work from home. So everything need to report to us so that we can make sure that everything is, uh, is in compliance with the federal uh, regulation. Okay, and there is some um, like six months. There is a verification required to to be submitted by by you. So just want to make sure that to check the IPAN system, and then you will find our reminder. Okay. So last thing is, if a person is going, if you guys plan to terminate a person, or if a person resign, we uh you have to um. Uh, uh, submit the e form. It's called withdrawal H1B or termination of H1B employment through IPAN so that we can report to the USCIS so that this will, will kind of um, let the USCIS know so we are no longer liable to pay this person. Okay. Okay. And then the extension once you have an H1B employee and then the extension, if you plan to hire him again for another three years or one year after this current H1B, just make sure, be sure to get ready, to get everything ready. Yeah, six to seven months to start to collect document and then submit everything in time for us to process the extension. Okay, uh, Mike, is there? Okay, so this is just the termination. You want to let us know, and then if there is, unfortunately, if there is a, it's is there gonna be a termination in your department coming up? Please contact us. Any any of our advisor is fine, but you can feel free to contact either Dan or myself because we do have a, a list of document that you you will need to provide to the employee they that that you guys are planning today off and then we just want to make sure that we um we are we are in compliance with all the government regulation 
Okay, so we, we do have some document that you guys need to sign and then we need to have this acknowledge form to the person. So you want to make sure to reach out to us to complete the legal process. Next slide. Yeah, you guys stay until the end. So I know there are a lot of information, a lot of information. But then do you guys have any questions for us? Then do you have any reminder or something? Um, I think the only um, reminders or things that I kind of want to go back on is, you know, like the importance of, because um, we, I know like in your part of the presentation, um, Chi Wei, you, you could talked a lot about the prevailing wage and that's, that is a really important part of the H process. So that's why sometimes, um, if it's a, the job description that is submitted is really crucial for that. And that's how we make a lot of that determination is looking at um, the job duties um, because we really do have to match that to the government's um, database. And it's a limited list that the government provides to us. It's similar to like, if you're familiar with the, um, the majors and the SIP codes on uh, an F1 students I-20 is we really have to take those and match them. So I really want to encourage, um, um, kind of robust job descriptions with what the responsibilities and duties are, because that really helps us find the appropriate code um, to match it. Um, and then the only other thing that I want to um, stress again is if you do know that you're going to have an extension or a hire or anything H-1B related coming up in the next six months, I would really recommend getting that in now. Um, yeah, as soon as as soon as you can, I think that's really the um, important thing, so we can get that processing um, now. Um, I do see some things in the chat. Um, oh, gee, we well, took care of that. Uh, will we have access to slide? Are those H one B? Are those in H one B status given in orientation, so they know if any changes must be reported to both the department as well? Um. We think, yeah, ahead, it's, it's like, uh, this is a very good question. We are actually doing it this afternoon though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so in the past we do have, um, we do have this H1B checking for every H1B employee, but now that uh, we do not have that for them because we, we feel like it, it has become, it seems to become a burden for them. So now we, just uh, send out emails to remind them all these very important checking items. And then now, for now, we are hosting this um, H1B checking. This is now for individual H1B meeting. We will have this um, like group of group meeting we offer to the H1B employees. For example, this afternoon, we will have our first ever H1B checking. Uh, well, I would say workshop or event, so networking, checking, networking event mm -hmm. for H1B. So we are going to go through all these very important items included, these very important job changes that they will need to the, the department BA know. I understand that some of you do not work directly with them. So some of you may work for multiple H1B, so you may not know the job change. So yeah. I understand it's very important for the H1B to be aware of this as well. So what we do now is that we send email to them once they receive the approval and then to remind them that if there's any change they need to let you know. And then we also re-emphasize that during our H1B check-in. Currently, we are planning to do H1B check-in twice a year. So uh, we, we hope that this message will reach them, yeah. But then if you can uh, think about other way that um, they will uh, help us reach out to them with this very important uh, um, thought that please just let us know. Yeah, you just look, it, it's sometimes it's really hard to reach out to people and get re people read your message. Yeah. Okay. There's some more in here. Um, yeah. Is there no longer the criminal clearance step? 
um and does oh well, i guess we can do that because they're separate yeah. um criminal clearance check what do you think chi wei i i i don't at least not not, not, not to for my ours. knowledge yeah <laughs> Um, yeah probably for your own department i i don't know but i would say it's yeah yeah. it's on the department and uscas might find something if we don't because we don't do that yeah we don't do that yeah and does it cost money to process an extension yes it it, it costs um well if it's a new employment we um it's we have a new 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 employment fee is five hundred. Well, on top of, it's hard to for me. Four hundred sixty <laughs> is the processing fee, right? And then if a new employee, you will need to add another five hundred, right? And then the premium processing is twenty eight oh five. Just to let you know, the extension it's the same amount of job. We we it's the same amount of work. We still need to put everything together. We still need to do the labor condition application. So everything is the same. So even and the price is the same. Okay, but then you have to do everything minus the five hundred because it's not a new one. So it's it's the same amount of uh, processing fee. Our internal processing fee is also the same because we want we need to do the same amount of job, but the only difference is that you do not need to pay the five hundred that is reserved for new employee. Okay. Who get the who gets the notification for the six months verification? Okay, it will be the department. It will be the person who submit the H one B petition. It it will not be the H one B employee because they they are our employee, and then we have the we have the uh decision power to decide whether we want to continue to hire them. Yeah, so you are welcome. Anything else? Thank you. Yeah, we 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 appreciate you. Yeah, we we know that we cannot do anything without your help. Yeah, and then just feel free to reach out to us if you have any question or just want to stop by our office to say hi. Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it then. I mean. Yeah, and to just echo Chi Wei, if you have any questions, like we're we're more than happy to explain and stuff like that, because it's not it's it is not an intuitive process. It is, I mean, sometimes it gets very weird and complicated. So I sometimes I I personally really appreciate um the help that I get from you guys when I reach out mm. with probably some really weird questions sometimes, <laughs> but like, I mean, we're asking for a reason, like there is a reason for that. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. We really appreciate your partnership. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I guess that's it for today and reach out to us if you have any further question. And I think Mike, uh, we'll send a copy of the PowerPoint slide that we go over today to everyone. All right. All right. Thank you all. Have Thank a you. good lunch. Bye. Bye-bye.